Hi guys, I know it's been a while, but this episode was recorded, like the whole series, a few months ago. We did it without real plans on when to release. I hope you enjoy and let us know what you think about us on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Horus Heresy Book Club. You're here back with me, Caro, and Jason. Hi, guys. How's it going? Oh, you know, I really appreciate uh, coming on. Uh, we over at the Heresy Grad School like to uh, call it a return to the mother cast. So we always like to check in and see what you guys are doing. Well, I'm sorry to tell you this one, but I'm absolutely not part of the mother cast either. <laughs> One day, one day we're going to make it back to the main parts. Ugh, I feel like you have an in if you want it. I mean, I could, but for the most part, like, I feel like I'm just going in if, if there's something cool going on. I'm really bad with following up on news. <laughs> to be fair, out of all of us here in the uh, whole Remembrancers Retreat Network, your segment definitely has the coolest artwork. That's, that's true. I really love it. Like, my wife is super biased, and even she thinks your artwork is cooler than mine, so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Oh, absolutely. I can hear her in the background. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. She's making fun of me as we're, like, sending each other memes. Yeah, that's the way it goes. So this time we have a plan for the whole book already. It is. It should be a four-part series. But like always, I'm not making any promises at all. It works out better that way because, I mean, who who's going to complain if we run long? Like, I'm sorry we give you more content. Yeah, excuse me. And the only thing I don't want to happen is one day where the, this podcast is longer than if you listen to the book. But honestly, just, just the both. Listen to the book. Now, the, in general, you don't have to have listened to Legion or any of the books, but I feel like it's more fun if you know what we're complaining and talking about. Well, I'm complaining and we're talking about. Yeah, I feel like we do better. We're not so much a review as we are like um, just pulling it apart and kind of going into some of the more entertaining bits of it. So today we start with Legion, Secret and Lies, written by the Napnet. And Legion is one of those books, Austin keeps talking about it, because back before it was released, nobody knew what was the deal of the Alpha Legion. It was a mystery. And this book here has most, no, has some of the answers. Nobody knows what the Alpha Legion is doing. And this book has, weirdly enough, not a bigger focus on Space Marines. You know, that's actually one of the first things I was going to bring up. Uh, I really appreciate, especially, well, I guess not an old Dan Abnett book. That'd be like Riders of the Dead, but we'll call it like a midline Dan Abnett book. Uh, I really appreciate any book in the Heresy series that doesn't center solely around Astartes. It feels like especially into the mid and definitely into the later uh, run when we start getting into like you know book 30 35 mm -hmm. uh, and later it's really just all the starties all the time and that it can get a little monotonous you know yeah yeah the starties are just all kind of same well yeah they're interesting to a point but i mean they're all different versions of the same guy you know just color-coded for your convenience but uh the humans here are basically what make it happen through most of the book. Uh, Astartes are kind of taking a back seat in a lot of roles. And even when Astartes do come in, like a couple of the Alpha Legion uh, engagements we're going to talk about in a little bit, I'm sure, uh, they're very non-standard. Uh, it's not just a bunch of Astartes with bolt guns like firing back and forth at each other. Uh, it is single or tiny squads of Astartes using um, local weapons and weaponry and uh, armor and everything. Uh, 
fighting in very non-traditional Astartes ways. And that's really cool to see because, again, those back and forth Astartes engagements can get really monotonous, you know? Yeah, when I when I grab a book, I don't want to just read about big fights. What I appreciate about the Alpha Legion is they are above just a brutal slaughter. They're still doing it, but they also use different methods. Yeah. But yeah, this book, it starts, and right away we are with a person. Huarto Bronzi. I also appreciate always these short pages. The uh, first heretic had it as well about uh, Sarini. And here mm -hmm. we just have Bronzi as the main character. Yeah. Bronzi and um, Pedro Seneca. Oh, that's how you pronounce her. Well, it's I'm a little spoiled, uh, especially in these early, um, probably through about the first 20 books or so, the Heresy series. I've listened to the audiobooks two or three times each. Uh -huh. So I've got a lot of what I assume are the correct pronunciations. Um, you know, with names and stuff, I tend to take the uh, tend to take the word of, uh, you know, uh, Jonathan Keeble or um, Toby Longworth or yeah. Martin Ellis on how they're pronounced. So yeah, that's the right way. But yeah, so starting out, uh, Hurtado Bronzi has to be probably one of my favorite uh, human characters in the Heresy series. And I think probably because he's relatable, like it doesn't matter if it's, you know, his superior officer or an Astartes, uh, Hurtado Bronzi is done with your shit a day ago. And he doesn't have time for it. No, he, he tries. He's... He's getting himself in some real interesting situations just because of who and what he is. Uh, he does not seem to be able to let anything go, which is kind of a driving point and why he gets uh, kind of deep in with what's going on uh, as we dip a little further into the book. So while we're here, like, you know, prologue chapter one, another thing I really like about Dan Abnett and... As much as I like Aaron Dembski Bowden, I think mm -hmm. this is something Dan Abnett does even better uh, in a lot of ways. He has this way of bringing in new things to the lore. Like uh, Dan Abnett is the person who thought up like Vox casters and um, Prometheum uh, mm -hmm. for, you know, that are just staples of, you know, Warhammer lore now. And things like this. Um, just some of the things he thinks up, like the Nerthine as a race, uh, Folk's Blades, uh, the liquid nitrogen packs, they're called Lichnite, uh, that the um, Geno 52 Chiliad used to destroy Nerthine weaponry. Uh, things like that are basically like Dan Abnett making stuff up, but they seem to fit right into the lore like they've always been there. You know, they have the exact same feel and you can, he's really good at like theming, you know, entire civilizations to feel like unique, but also part of the lore. And I think that's really valuable in a way, I'm not going to name names, but some authors have a habit of describing things to a T, like you can even kind of understand which like games workshop kit now on sale for forty five ninety nine that they are describing, you know, in their writing. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. And I feel like um Dan Abnett is head and shoulders above kind of making things feel like the Warhammer universe, but not, you know, being kind of stuck in that pattern. And I really like that about his writing. Oh, what he does is it feels like it's a universe which is real but it's not it's not a made up place where you can just go out and buy the minis it's yes three people real persons and i mean all of those people we're reading about are exceptional oh yeah um that's something i've said i really like about aaron dinsky bowden too i think he and dan abnett are exceptional mm -hmm. at crafting worlds and characters that interact with each other and those worlds like in a believable human way and oh, yeah. it's, at the, it's at the opposite end of the spectrum from 
some occasional writers who really just feel like they're kind of describing banging action figures together, you know? Yeah, there's some books I don't, I can only listen to while, we're spe while, while I speed them up, because otherwise mm -hmm. I just can't stand it. They just drag. It ha it happens. But yeah. Now, where we where are we with this book? We are in Tel Uthan, Nith, Nerf, two years. Tel Uthan. There we go. Nerf, two years before the heresy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think timeline wise, this would put this would be roughly at the same time when the Prospero conflict is starting out. Because that was two years ish before Istvan three. I need to. I, it's been too long, I, and I'm horrible with times and dates. So probably, I tr I trust I trust you fully here. I mean, that may be a mistake, but <laughs> we live for uh, mistakes. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're not professing to be, you know teaching a college class at the moment. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I've never went to college, so I'm sure as hell not going to teach any classes there. So, think about what I love about those um, the cha or all the war bands? No. Regiments? No. The... Oh, gotcha. The... Yeah, the um, companies. Yeah, the companies. So the companies of the Geno 5-7, they have great names. I sometimes wonder if they got the names because they forgot what the words usually or what the words meant before. <laughs> and we have the dancers, we have the clowns, we have all kinds of weird, funny guys. You can't forget a Bronzy's company, the Jokers. Yeah. They do seem very, like, fanciful and, like, they're very colorful for such an otherwise serious and grim regiment. I seem like they're out of the circus. Oh, yeah. Uh, it even describes the clowns, uh, their banner mm -hmm. and symbol is like a, you know, a, a skull, but done up in like rouge makeup. You know, kind of almost like vaudevillian. Very clownish. So we dropped off with Soneka fighting uh, with Nerthines. Seneca is one of the guys we're going to follow for a little bit, just because interesting things happen to him. Almost too interesting. Like, I've loved going back through this book again, because the first time I went through it, I was kind of, you know, listening to it, and I was kind of naive. I didn't understand, like, some of the uh, kind of subtler shading. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think going back through it, it's fun to pick apart, like, oh, was this something the Alpha Legion intended? Was this something the Nerthine did all on their own? Who's pushing who? Honestly, probably nobody really knows. Unless you ask somebody from the Alpha Legion. There it was a plan all the time. Well, I mean, that's kind of what they do. Like, if they don't, you know, absolutely take credit for it, you know, they could just fake it until they make it, and, you know, they'll come out on the other side looking way more confident than everybody else. Yeah, just own whatever happened. Uh, two, I really like here how they describe the organization of the Chiliad. Um, not just like the company names, which are pretty cool, but actually how they organize them at different steps. So the troopers themselves are actually vat grown from harvested um, eggs from the Uxors, who are, you know, the, the mild psychers that are like battlefield commanders. But uh, then the um, sort of company leaders are uh, called Hetman, and they're actually brought in from other regiments yep. uh, kind of cycle in fresh blood and fresh ideas, which I thought was kind of a cool setup. And uh, what's interesting later uh, into Chapter 3, uh, John Grammaticus, who I think think we are meeting for the very first time in the Horus Heresy series, uh, actually mentions how the Emperor himself kind of stole some organizational points from the Geno 5-2. That just makes sense. There we have a whole... So, those guys were around before the Emperor even 
started taking over Terra, I think. Mm -hmm. And he kept them around and adopted some ideas because A, they apparently, well, the ones who fought against him either got neutered or killed. Mm. The ones who fought with him were allowed to stay and they're still a beloved regiment in the world of Terra. And he took over some of the things they did, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Gino 5-2 Chiliad actually end up being one of the old 100, which are, you know, the 100 regiments from the Unification War, essentially the, you know, militias and whatnot, the uh, 100 most um, experienced and effective out of all of the... Uh, mortal armies that the emperor used to take over the uh take over terra originally yeah here the dancers the name but a uh, sonica strip was coded the dancers a name that they owned for almost 800 years mm -hmm. that's a good name and a proud company which probably not everybody or not only good people get to be in those territories either because well good people Either you were lab grown or you were worthy enough to get recruited to them. One of the two. Yeah, 50 50 chance, I guess. Well, let's not think too much about that. And yeah, we get to Bronzy. Bronzy, the first introduction where he's not um, into bigger trouble, he's about to get himself into trouble. Not because of anything particularly he is has to, has done wrong. He's just very noisy. He's like he's like a granny. You know, doesn't everybody have the neighborhood granny? This old lady who's always looking out of the window and reporting on everybody. He's that. <laughs> he's exactly that. He's that. That that is a pretty fair summation of Hitato Bronzy. But uh, I think at this point, I knew Bronzy was something special when he uh, pulls a gun on an Astartes. That is, um, that's pretty great. Uh, not only does he keep from, uh, you know, having a seizure when an Alpha Legionnaire sneaks up on him when he's uh, in the bathroom, <laughs> uh, he also goes on to pull a gun and demand answers from that same Alpha Legionnaire. It's pretty ballsy. It is. I mean, to be fair, a lot of the people around they don't they don't get told this is Nerstardi. They are just aware there's a specialist there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a somebody with the size and build of Nerstardi. I don't even know if this guy was wearing armor. I don't I think don't he was. Think he was. I think he was just in one of the local um, what are they called dust shawls? Yeah. So yeah, there's this specialist kind of looking like an Astarte. Seems like he's pretty important. He's only talking to the Oxlers, nobody else. And then Bronzy is there, trying to figure out what's going on. Trying to get close, trying to listen in. And just being a noisy, noisy guy. He kind of makes trouble for himself. Oh, absolutely. I mean, now, to be fair, he's doing it because he realizes that uh, his best friend slash... Uh, guy that owes him 20 bucks, uh, Pedro Seneca, is gonna get left out to dry. And uh, his company, the uh, the dancers, just get cut to pieces in a nerthine ambush. They do. And Bronzy owns up to even... Well, he is doing something even more ballsy than trying to talk, to just talk to a legionnaire. He complains to him. He tries to... And he pretty much tries to start a fight, and just because the Alpha Legionnaire doesn't go for it, he's fine. One thing I thought was kind of interesting. Bronzy pulls a gun on this guy and demands answers. Uh, the Alpha Legionnaire waits until he answers a few questions. Bronzy drops the gun, and then the Legionnaire like, smacks it out of his hand. I think that's kind of interesting because a Laz weapon is probably not going to do that much to an Astarte, even if he's unarmored. So I thought it was kind of interesting how cautious the Legionary was, even 
to like what's basically a small sidearm to him. I mean, I guess nobody really wants to get shot, but even if it's from something small, but I think it was also so he doesn't get too much attention pulled on himself. If somebody shoots a gun inside your in sleeping quarters or wherever they met afterwards, this will gonna this is gonna get a lot of attention to him. This alpha legionnaire tries to. I think it was more of a power move, personally. I I don't think it was as much any sort of concern for his safety. Oh yeah, not not for the safety. Oh goodness. Well, I think another oh another scene I really like here uh, when the Nerthine ambush the dancers. And they are saved by the little skirmishing squad of Alpha Legionaries. Uh, this is another cool thing. It's not a you know generic squad of Space Marines. They are not armored. They're wearing the dust shawls. And they're using local arms and armor. Which I thought was pretty cool. Like each of the Alpha Legionaries has a Falks. Like along with his bolt gun. Mm-hmm. And I think that's pretty unique for the Alpha Legion. You know, they don't just, well, in a lot of cases, they don't just, you know, plow through. They're actually kind of working, using some of the uh, own locals, you know, arms and armor against them. You expect less if the person kind of looks like you. It's less likely for them to attack you right away. Because what's special about those guys? They have to fight. They use our magic. Right, the air magic. I love it, especially because it's missed us, misspelled so badly. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, so the dancers, they got ambushed. Another thing which is great, they call out for help. And the answer they're getting is, yeah, we know, we're on the way. And that's not a great question or not a great message you get when you try to get help. Just... Like, ah. Those poor guys... As Right, as your company is being hacked apart by, you know, Ekvener with uh, these like crazy Falks blade swords, it's not not a terrific response. I gotta gotta admit. Yeah, the small things which help is a this main city also starts blowing up, well, mm -hmm. being on fire in the same time as the dancers get hacked apart, which doesn't help them, but everybody else is happy about it. Uh, yeah. And at least they get uh, some space marines to come back and try to help them. We do find out uh, in this conversation Bronzy is having uh, at gunpoint with another Alpha Legionnaire that he, the Alpha Legionnaire did instruct his squad to try and save and assist as many of the dancers as possible, which I felt like was actually pretty considerate for a space marine. Yeah, yeah, as considerate as it's going to get for them. And we also have, for the first time, the all-going line. After the, after the dancers, well, the leftovers of the dancers are saved, the Alpha Legion guys come up, and uh, the Sonica asks for the name, and I am a Farius. I am a Farius. We all are a Farius. We are Alpha Legion, and we are all one. Which... At this point, it's such a cool line, and in the future, where we are right now, it's such an overused joke. But I just love it so much. It's the first time in the book that it is mentioned like this. Yeah, this is the first book for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, a spoiler alert for like a, gosh, what is this, like a 14-year-old book at this point? Um this is the first time that we figure out in the entirety of Horus Heresy history that the Alpha Legion has a twin Primarch. Yeah, uh, this is what Austin keeps talking about. Nobody um, in the Heretic, there's a scene where you see all the pods dropping. One of them, the pod of Afarius, clearly, where, it, where it's mentioned that there are too many limbs and too many arms. So there's already some seeds spread. And here we learn why there were too many limbs. 
But two, this is the first for so many ideas that are just taken for granted now, like later in the heresy. Like all of the Alpha Legion, you know, using Alpharius as a cover story. Yeah. And again, later on, this is the first time that I was able to find um, that we get mention of John Grammaticus and the Cabal. Yeah, that's the first time I remember as well. Okay, so uh, the dancers got put back together, more or less, and they are now on vacation to heal up and get healthy again, more or less. Because there's right. no reason to keep the dancers around while they're pretty much cut up and there are only a few people left. At the uh, lovely Visages Hotel and Resort Spa. Right, with wine and gambling and all the good stuff. And a valley full of giant heads. And small heads. And small heads, yeah. See, I feel like this is one of those weird just details that no other author would think to put in. And I don't know, with another author, it might not even work. Like, it might feel kind of like weird time-wasting. But just getting to hear about Pedro Seneca and Demi Chaban, like hanging out and drinking wine and sending their soldiers out to find, you know, these teeny little, you know, heads to that they've made a game out of because they're so crazy bored. It just, it feels like such a Dan Abnettism. Yeah, man, what else are you going to do when you're in a valley full of skulls? You're going to make up a game to collect skulls. And then make your direct reports run out and get them for you. Oh, also good, yeah. While you drink wine and do... I'm not sure what peck is supposed to be. Maybe cocaine? Like, I'm not super sure. It's They, say, it, they seem to use them like people used to use snuff boxes. Which it I think is cocaine. could just be um, tobacco. Just tobacco. Yeah, tobacco. I like cocaine better. But a good old nicotine. Cocaine, cocaine is what they get in the combat drugs when they're when the starties are firing up. To get them high, popped up. Or is that meth? Mm-hmm. Maybe both. Some sort of amphetamine, I would assume. Probably. Clearly. My granddad used to keep a, a hidden snuff box that he liked to pretend my grandma didn't know about until she made him quit in his work truck. <laughs> when he was doing yard work. It was certainly not cocaine. <laughs> I'm trying to imagine my grandpa on cocaine. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I, I gotta stop now. This is no... No worries. But yeah, uh, Bronzy goes over and visits his old friend. First of all, he owes him money. Second of all, what else is noisy, noisy Bronzy gonna do? Because he's gonna... He's asking all the important questions. But who was there and if he saw somebody. And where's my 50 bucks? Yes, where's my money? So, let's see. Here is... So, this actually took me a little bit. I didn't get it, like, the first time I listened to it because it was, like, a little offhanded. But I think it's neat, the interplay and what the Alpha Legion's doing. Because when the chief medical examiner uh, brings Seneca and Bronzy in to, um, you know, check out the uh, dead body uh, that she thinks is actually one of Seneca's company. Uh, he kind of instantly recognizes the dancer as fake, which I thought was interesting because they don't super explain how he does it. But um, even though the um, corpse doesn't have a face... Uh, he pretty much instantly knows it's like not one of his company because they're all like accounted for. But um, we see like as they're examining the body, he's got like a little what they think is a nerfing tattoo, which kind of makes sense from their point of view because they sort of have like this weird reptile fetish. Yeah, they do. And uh, small, small aside, after watching like so much Tiger King, I can't hear the word like Dan Abnett used crocodilians and not just think of like, you know, keep your hands off my crocodilians. My crocodilians. And... <laughs> exactly. Like I can't not 
think about it. Or then, like, Michael Jackson's poor crocodilians being set on fire for, like, insurance fraud. Poor guy. A poor, poor crocodile. But, um, yeah, this, um, this fake dancer actually seems to be an Alpha Legion agent, um, which is kind of neat. Uh, from the, uh, what would it be, the third black book, mm-hmm. um, they talk about how Alpha Legion would insert operatives into both sides of a conflict, like even the friendly sides, just because they don't trust anybody. And oh, yeah. what's, what's neat is they refer to them as sparatoi which is Greek for um, literally sown men, uh, sown, you know, like you would sow seeds. Yeah. And in Greek mythology, Sparatoi were supposed to uh, leap from the ground uh, after being the uh, teeth of a dragon were sown like seeds and Sparatoi would leap forth from the earth. So it's kind of a neat little interplay with, you know, like classic Greek mythology Mm -hmm. and, I was always a big fan of that. I thought it was pretty neat. No, it's pretty awesome. It's just interesting. Where, which legions pull from? Oh, yeah. But yeah, our guys, they are none the wiser. They don't know yet where this body is from. They assume it has to be uh, Nuthern. Especially, or what's also interesting for them, this guy does not have a heart. He has been has undergone extensive surgery. This is not a normal person anymore. So, of course, dear Bronzy tries to inform everybody, well, the important person, the Oxer, about what's happening and to let her know what they found, which in no, in no history ever w- didn't work out when you just called your superior to try and tell them something super important. It always works. There's n- right. no way that this never works or this doesn't work. A phone call is always safe. Like this is the start to like half a dozen James Bond movies. Right? Like every single movie where it starts with like the agent getting burned by like his own office. So let's see here. Bronzy, uh, cleverly in Bronzy fashion, doesn't mention that uh, Pedro Seneca uh, knows about this uh, infiltrator that they have unmasked. Uh, So instead, uh, Bronzy says uh, he wants Seneca to be his ace in the hole that nobody knows about and to stay here in uh, Camp Visages. So uh, he takes uh, his new buddy, uh, Demi Shaban, who uh, I feel... uh, was not long for this world already. But, uh, so they load up this body and fly off in a speeder that they pilfer to, uh, meet the contact that the Uxor gives them. And, uh, the first time through, I did not think about this, Mm -hmm. but, so, very, very soon after Bronzy and Demi Shaban leave this, uh, rest and relaxation and, you know, re- uh, recuperation camp, uh, the nerthing attack and more or less wipe it out. Yep. Right the away. The timing of that did not strike me as suspicious the first time through. Well, it didn't. It, it did not. Um, well, that's fair. Just the nerthing, they are a constant thing constant force which would be in the background it just makes sense for them to attack you randomly but this okay. is not a, it's just too random or too good to be random right it's like the timing's too perfect it's like they happen to attack this specific camp which is supposed to be i mean it's like a med a medical and rehab facility it's not on the front lines yeah it's nothing big or important and they just so happen to attack a few hours after the Alpha Legion have something there that they want to cover up. Oh, and they also killed a Medicaid. Oh, yeah, they did. They basically killed uh, the camp commander. What was it? Um, Kosolov. And they kill the medical examiner. Basically, anybody who Bronzy named in the... Uh, 
<laughs> when he was talking to the Uxor. Oh, what who he thought was the Uxor? Mm hmm. Also, good point. But hey, he got a day. We jump back after. Well, we leave the poor camp, which just got shut up, and go back to Bronzy, who where who tries to meet with whoever the Oxer sent. And surprise, it's nobody. He knows it's just more legionnaires. So, what's what I really, really love um, in the third black book. They mention that the Alpha Legion has been seen in almost a dozen different recorded uh, armor schemes and uh, in different company colors. Mm -hmm. And I really like here that the Alpha Legionnaire that Bronzy meets, and apparently the other few uh, operating on Nerth don't have the standard uh, teal and iron color scheme. Uh, these guys are actually wearing armor that's purple trimmed in silver. Yeah, and green markings. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty far out there. Oh my god, there's a perfect, perfectly valid scheme for the Alpha Legion, because nobody tells the Alpha Legion how they are supposed to look like. They're not right. the, they're not the um, Ultramarines. They yeah. don't go after norms. But yeah, Bronzy meets the Alpha Legionnaire. The Alpha Legionnaire meets Bronzy, shoots his friend... And we are we leaving those guys with the words for the Emperor. Which is also a perfect line for the Alpha Legion. It's the only thing they ever say if you ask them why they're doing things. I mean, it's a pretty good cover. It is. I need those donuts for the Emperor. <laughs> so, we leave Bronzy and this Alpha Legionnaire. And we leave Demi Shaban in several pieces. And we meet John Chromaticus, the best guy. The best guy. I don't know. I gotta say, if I was gonna pick a singer, single perpetual, I think I'd have to go with Damon Pratanus. I don't know him, so I'm still rooting all for John. Uh, once we get to uh, Unremembered Empire, uh, Damon Pratanus is pretty terrific, if for no other reason than the voice actor in uh, the audiobook decided to give him a crazy New York accent. Okay, okay, that's it pretty is, good. It's so amazing. Like, at the end of that book, tiny, you know, spoilers for like a 10-year-old book, uh, John Grammaticus loses his perpetuality. And oh, right. uh, Yeah, you know, when he wakes back up in like the Cabal Medical Facility, and Damon Pertanis stands there, you know, like when he wakes up, and he's like, that's it, Johnny, that's your last one. It's like straight out of like, I don't know, 1940s Brooklyn. It's just perfection. Yeah. yeah, see, I listened to this book as well, and he just didn't strike me as much, but I also don't know accents that well, especially not New York. And I just have a deep, deep love for John. Because John here, we don't have enough undercover stories and intelligence going on already. No, John is here, and he's infiltrating but not for the Alpha Legion. And yeah, John has a great introduction. He is probably human. He's essentially human. He used to be one. And just got changed a little bit. He's very, very proud of his heritage. He's just a great character. And he also met the Emperor. He did meet the Emperor quite a while ago. Before he was the Emperor. Yeah. He was just kind of like another dude. And I love that they shared a handshake and then the Emperor gave him like a knowing wink and was like, hey, I know what you are. Grammaticus is pretty interesting to me too, just because by all accounts, he's not really, besides maybe his psychic talent, he's not really superhuman. No, he just doesn't die. And it's a soccer. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty good as a human. Yeah. I really like, too, how the Perpetuals all seem to have their own sort of unique brand of perpetuality. Like, um, Vulcan, the Primarch, is a Perpetual, and he, like, regenerates like uh, Wolverine from, you know, the comics. But when John Grammaticus dies, he doesn't regenerate like that. He just, like, mysteriously enters stage left again at some time farther down. And 
But also he in here he talks about how this body he's still getting used to it. So I don't really know how it works. Do they make do they make a new body? Do they just take somebody over? I don't think they explain it. He just got a new body. But he's there as um agent of the Geno 5 to Kiliad. He also is the one who gives us some insight to the inner workings and where the Emperor took some information from. Like the beginning part is when he mentions like the Emperor himself was impressed with how the Geno 5-2 was organized and kind of stole a few things from it, uh, from their organizational system. There's also nothing more I hate in books when they start uh, saying female. They were all female, all aged. This whole part about all the girls is super weirdy, weird and creepy for me. Just talking about them the way they do. And just co constantly saying females. I just... <sighs> it's one of those things you don't call, just go around and call somebody your female. Wouldn't have been too hard to say women. That is more than fair. It's kind of an awkward scene. Yeah, he is meeting with the Uxor. So the way the Uxor works... Like we mentioned earlier, the Geno 5 all their women in the ranks, they have some psychic powers. The psychic powers are the strongest while they're young, and the older they get, the less prevalent those powers are. So the way they are working is there's one head, Axer, and she always has a following of different younger girls around who are there to A, help her with the psychic, and B, learn, so when she is herself is not strong enough anymore, they can take over. And the one we're talking about, uh, she is slowly starting to lose her powers a little bit, and she hates it. Oh, right. Uxor Roshana. But yeah, they think John is um, Koenig, I think that's his name. Koenig Henneke. Yeah, Koenig Henneke. And he goes into the cities of the Nutherns and tries to figure out intelligence gathers information where can we attack and he also gives them some information but not because he collected them but just because he knows as this is also where we figure out the cabal is are involved and the cabal was on this planet before and they know what's going on here yeah the cabal were here even before like humanity even first touched down and i think it's entertaining that uh we even get from grammaticus's side like as he's telling um, the Uxor, you know, some of the things he's quote unquote learned while he was undercover, like uh, the harbor they use used to be a place for a, you know, intergalactic ship to touch down. Uh, he has to edit his own information to make it seem less precise so it's not suspicious. Yeah, if you know exactly when somebody died, probably you're worrying on it. If you approximately know what, you're just real good at reading the signs. Yeah. Uh, two, we figure out here, we get a hint of uh, John Grammaticus's psychic speciality. Uh, he's a logo kind, which... Uh, pretty much any language that he hears, he can pick up and converse fluently in. Which is pretty handy for a uh, undercover agent. Yeah, I would love to have that talent. Just imagine oh, all the good things you could do. Right? Imagine all the people you could talk to. Imagine all the memes you could understand. Oh no! <laughs> I already understand memes out of two places. That's bad enough. Oh yeah, the potential is limitless. Your limit is the universe. Quite literary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's kind of entertaining a little later in here. He talks about how he can understand any language he's come across so far. It's just some he can't communicate in. Yeah. Uh, some Xenos languages because he lacks the uh, biological parts to uh, make reciprocal sounds. He can talk to ants. He can talk to anything. I wonder if he could talk to animals. That would be fun. He did say... I wonder. I mean, he's a thousand years old. He's had to have tried at some point, right? 
So his first death, his first death was right after he met the emperor. Right after the emperor told him, hey, we should talk. He dies. We don't know how or why or when. Exactly, we just know he dies. So I don't know, did he, did he have the power before he became a perpetual? Did he already have those powers? Did they come with him being perpetual? That is a good question. I do not know. Also his last name... If he would just have two dots above the O, it would just mean king in German. So it's also a good cover name. Uh, cover name. Oh, yeah. We have a bit more war talk, a little bit more of stuff. And in the end, Koenig and Roxana, the Oxer, stay behind and um, Jean move, starts the moves on her. Because why not? Finally, after 700 years, it's time to make the moves on a lady. (laughs) I did think it was really... I don't know. It's kind of odd. They specifically mention it's been 700 years since he's allowed himself to feel for anything. Like, for anybody. Which I thought was kind of a weird detail to work in here. I mean, the same as weird as the fact that he allows himself to sweat... I didn't think that was as weird as the detail on the 700 years since he, you know, allowed himself to feel and be with the lady because he was just like talking about the uh, Huxors in training and how Uh. they were so immature and all they could think about was, you know, going and getting with a man and they were all thirsty and he's like talking down to them. And then the first thing he does is like, hey, close the door behind you so I can put the moves on this lady. Well, that's what we call the Moderna Horror Complex. <laughs> yeah, good. he just starts the moves and of course they work, which I also don't understand. She's 28 and his body was of the one of a 52-year-old. Like, <sighs> And it wasn't because of money, like it would be most of the time. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know. It's just weird. Would be as old as my dad. No. I mean, in reality, he's like a thousand. Yeah, that makes it ever- everything worse, I guess. Right? That's even worse than, like, I don't know, Bella and Edward. That's... Okay, <laughs> well, that was terrible. That was just terrible. I don't know if we had the official introduction yet. This is also Megan. Oh, hi, sorry. She's my wife, and she has smart opinions. <laughs> and very smart opinions. Not about, not about Warhammer. Well, I kind of like talking about Warhammer stuff with her, because she has, like... The complete outsider's view of it, and she's pointed out a lot of like stupid crap that doesn't make sense, and she's had some uh, pretty interesting like non-standard views on a lot of stuff. We always some we all need sometimes the point of an outsider. Exactly. Damn, I caught myself I'm still as an outsider. I only read the books I don't really play that much. It's all part of the hobby. Exactly. Yeah, 700 years was a long time, long enough for him to forget the consequence of a proper connection. You know what? I, I As a hobby, uh, this will be the first book that, well, Jason's reading it to me. Uh, this will only be my first book. Uh, my I've only had listened to like one short story, a couple of podcasts, and I've only played one uh, ZM game, but hey... I'm 1-0, so, you know, that's a pretty good average there, just saying. <laughs> For that one game. That uh, one game, I won it, so. Yeah, there we go. Can't risk that winning, sc- winning streak. Gonna rest on those laurels. That's right. And, and I only played that ZM game because I really wanted to see how two of his uh, units would stack up against each other. The two that he normally took to ZM games, I wanted to... to, to Take his Mechanicum against his Fleximancer, just to see what would happen. And good things happened, I take it. The Fleximancer won. Of course. He, he did. The Fleximancer is an uh, unstoppable force. Yeah, he flexed on the Mechanicum. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we check back in with Koenig. He has uh, the nice, sweet afterthoughts of whatever happened there. And he gets a phone call from his superiors. Not cr- not quite a phone call but he gets a mind phone call which i imagine is very unsettling it definitely creeped him out like 
because especially later on in a couple of the other books, it's basically the Cabal can contact you in any shiny surface, uh, but they seem to prefer water. Yeah. Uh, I think this one's a mirror. And uh, yeah, just uh, it's like, what if you couldn't turn your cell phone off if anything around you was reflective? And you can't hang up. You can't ignore it. You, they just are there no matter what you're doing. It's like, John, John, I can see you. Don't 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 turn away. I can, I Come can on. see you. You're right. What you doing? Cover up. OK, we talk business, John, right now, no matter what you're doing. And they're constantly judging. I mean, the only thing they say is you have taken a wrong step. To be f <laughs> the intimate bond you have made with this female is impairing your mission. Once again, female, come on. <laughs> Which is also a sphere from Cabal. Yeah, I, mean, I think it may, it, it's still weird, I'll agree. But I think makes it makes here. at least a little more sense. Because Gahet considers like all humanity beneath him. Yeah. Then pretending I'm not threatening you. Yeah, he tries to sneak out on her. She wakes up. He pretends he didn't absolutely try to sneak out. And then he goes out for his mission. Smooth, John. Super smooth. He is very smooth. I mean, his moves he put on earlier, they're also very, very smooth. <laughs> I mean, you think with a thousand years to practice, he would, you know, be able to... I mean, he just said he didn't do it for 700 years or 600. Yeah, 700 years he didn't make moves. You forget a lot of the things. Oh, no. He didn't say he didn't make moves. It said he didn't allow himself to feel for another person outside of physically. Oh, well, okay, that's fair. So, uh... So he's just been seeing prostitutes in the past 700 years to take care of his physical needs? I mean, that's how it sounds to me. I'm just saying. Hey, maybe, I don't know what to... Maybe a virtual lady? Maybe we're in a grim tank future, so everything's possible. Yeah, virtual space ladies are definitely a possibility. Not like he'd have to learn some cool pickup lines, too. Oh, wait. He's a logo kind. He could learn pickup lines instantly in any language. How did we not think of this before? But the question is, do any of the pickup lines he... Or just because you know the language doesn't mean you understand the moves. He could say something which makes perfectly sense in one language... But um, it's a horrible, horrible insult in a different language. Oh, that's a good point. He's just logo kind. He's not like a, not like a master multiracial pickup artist. <laughs> Maybe that's why he's so bad at it. He has like so many languages piled up, all with terrible pickup lines. There we go. <laughs> Maybe he just read the game in multiple languages and it's like, yep, that that's how it works. Yeah. Start up, say hello, and then start nagging. To be fair, he didn't nag her, I think. Take your clothes off. Yeah, I mean, it was not nagging, it was just... From a 52-year-old spaceman. <laughs> well, all of them are spacemen, so... You know what, tonight I'm going to try that pickup live on Jason. I'm going to be like, hey, <laughs> hey, take your clothes off. I mean, take them off. You got them married. <laughs> how that line works on you. Yeah, okay, good. but only if they're snacks. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, your mom's are eating snacks in bed? Well, I shouldn't assume anything Kathy here. snacks should be everywhere, I don't know. There we go. <laughs> okay, sorry, we're getting sidetracked. Yeah. Very sidetracked, but it's fun. So, um, yeah, John. John is taking an escort for his new assignment. They are driving him down to the city so he can go shopping and get some more information. I just think it's interesting. Every time he thinks of the Emperor, he doesn't feel well. The first time, he just didn't pay attention anymore. The second time, he gets really pale. Which is just a sign how... What are, you just know how bad the Emperor has to be as a psychic force of John Grammaticus also freaks out even thinking about him or remembering how it was. He does mention that Gahet thought the Emperor might have been the only human that could have, you know, made it to the Cabal's inner circle. Oh, wow. Which is sort of impressive, but also says a lot about the Emperor, both good and bad. Yeah, the Cabal, they are... I mean, they hate humanity. They saw them, they didn't really think anything will happen to them, or they are not going to be any 
interest. And then you, people happened, and yes, we are at the point where they are all over the stars and are trying to reclaim the universe. Oops. Imagine your fruit fly starts building an empire in your kitchen. It would be similar. Right? But not just building an empire... Also, they're responsible for the fate of all of the, like, entirety of sentient life in the universe. Yeah, you can't squish them, because they are really important in that regard. At the same time, they start moving into your bedroom and trying to kick you out, and there's not much you can do about it. Because if you squish them, everybody dies. Poor cabal. They seem to have, like, just the start of their idea here. Because eventually the cabal go into, like, this complete genocidal like thought process for defeating chaos yeah where they figure out like no can't take any more chances we got to just wipe out humanity to starve out chaos which sort of makes sense from like their viewpoint but they don't think they're quite at that point yet because we can see they sent john grammaticus here to try and contact the alpha legion to try to sort of put some to put some measures in place before complete and total genocide. They're a bit late. It's two years before the heresy. Well, you know, for somebody that's like a thousand years old in Grammaticus's case, and I mean, he's like a young human compared to some of the other cabal operatives. I mean, two years is not that much time. Yeah, like I said, they're real late. <laughs> yeah, can't be real precise. Mm. We follow uh, we follow John, and we s hear or we can witness how he changes into a different person, which is super neat. He just keeps repeating who he is, changes a little bit up and a little bit and a little bit. He's just slipping deeper into the role he has to be in the end. That was pretty neat, like his little um, internal like memory device to like. Let's see if I here it is. Uh, I am John Grammaticus. I am John Grammaticus. I am John Grammaticus pretending to be Konig Hinnika. I am Konig Hinnika. I am Konig Hinnika pretending to be Desal Hulta. I am Desal Hulta. I shade Desal Hulta lim pretending. El shade Desal Saman Hulta lim tene ek. El shade Desal Saman Hulta lim tene ek. So not only is he like working through all of these different layers, in, um, yeah, layers of, like, personalities he's assumed. He's also working into, like, the natural dialects and, uh, like, the cultural base. And that's pretty neat. And he just walks right into the city after using a bit of psychic force. Because he doesn't need to cover completely yeah. up. He just uh, uses his mind to prevent giving sacrifices to the primordial annihilator. And annihilator. I can't pronounce it. Annihilated? To chaos. Yeah, exactly the word. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of neat too. It's like his mind, he basically does the large parts of his disguise and then just uses his mind to fill in the gaps so he doesn't have to you know, be super precise. Yeah, he uses Jedi Force pretty much. And we follow him through the city, Monlo. It is early in the morning. It is like every big city always busy, but there are points in time where it's less busy. We're just following. He's trying to get through a specific port, uh, point in the city to watch, uh, look at the walls there. Because he promised um, through me some intelligence. And he gets lost. He gets lost in the city. Oh, this reminds me of a point I wanted to touch on. from, And kind of way back in chapter one, when he's um, talking to the dying Equinerth. And the nerthing soldier says that uh, the Imperium is proof that there is true evil in the galaxy. And here, when um, he's starting to get a little panicky because he's not able to find his way around the city for some reason, like he did uh, the first time he was there, a uh, water carrier comes up to him and offers him like some water, and Grammaticus says, you know, no thanks. And the carrier responds, God love you anyway. And it says, Grammaticus shuddered. What the water carrier had said literally translated as the primordial annihilator immolate your living soul. And I thought that was like a cool dichotomy between 
them not understanding how deep that chaos is kind of tainted and how it's interwoven. Yeah. And it's like interwoven with all of their, you know, customs, but, and like just their very being. And it's like, you know, just a greeting like, Oh, you're welcome. See you later is, you know, glo- a, um, offhanded, you know, glorification of chaos. You know, in German, one of the things you say when you greet somebody you don't really know is uh, Grüß Gott, which pretty much means greetings to God. So mm-hmm. it could also mean all kinds of other things we don't know because, eh, if we look at it from the Warhammer lens, which also freaks me a little bit out now. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. I do my best. I, I can tell. Yeah, poor, poor John is lost in the city, but no worries. He finds a friend, an old friend of his. Which also, his mind or his memory has to be super crazy good. A, if you're so old, you can't really forget a lot. If you forget everything, like if you just have a normal human mind, I wonder if you would just keep forgetting stuff after like 100 to 200 years. I mean, you would have to after a while, right? I mean, John not, apparently. He remembers the Emperor, at least. Probably also gets super mind, uh, super mind with being a perpetual. That is kind of an interesting point, though. Like, perpetuality after a while would kind of start to become a problem if you couldn't forget anything. Because it comes... What would it be? Like, about... I've heard it discussed that maybe 300 to 400 years back, uh, like the English language is almost completely comprehen- incomprehensible to modern speakers. So you would have to go through a lot of different language processes in that time. But also he's a uh, logo kineticist. So not only does John have to deal with a thousand years of one language, he has to deal with a thousand years of influence and updating like basically every language he runs into. That's kind of a weird point to think about, like just from a language logist like mental logistics standpoint. Like he has a lot of information that he has to keep straight. He keeps it in a cloud. <laughs> Maybe. Space cloud. It's the only only thing I could think about. <laughs> I think those are the details you're not supposed to think about. Probably. Probably not, but we're here. We're thinking about it all. I, I get it. I'm just saying. I think those are the, like, hand wavy. Weil wegen is so. Just because, you know. Yeah. But he he manages to remember the name of the poor little fella. He promised to sell him some um, fetishes, I think it was. Firebreaks. Ah, yeah, firebreaks. Which... I mean, I guess are like normal bricks, but spicy. Like, I don't... I mean, maybe it's just brick coal, I guess. I don't really know how far they are advanced in the city. There's not a big description, but if you have water carry around, I always imagine a medieval town. Because you don't really have the water fountains. So you have guys walking around with a bucket. Well, it's kind of interesting, too, because they mentioned early on that the Nerthine are... They don't have space travel yet. They're technologically advanced enough to have guns and tanks, but they Mm -hmm. still prefer blades, which is really interesting because in like, um, in, I don't know, the earth culture, I guess, um, blades were definitely dying. It was not like a big overlap, like rain. Oh, as soon, as soon as you could shoot, the blades were out. I mean, even with just arrows. Oh, yeah. And so comparatively, it's interesting the Nerthine have like this overlap where they even have armored vehicles. Like, I mean, I think what would it be like? World War I would be our first like actual like armored tank, you know, comparatively, yeah. even though that was pretty primitive. But bef- like guns had definitely kind of over taken you know blades well ahead of our culture at that point and i'm sure there's going to be a single person who's like 
you know, working on their doctorate in like medieval weapons technology or something that's like screaming at his iPod right now. Oh, please send us an email. I really appreciate it a lot. Oh, yeah, definitely. Send us that email. I want to hear your thesis on how like super wrong I am about this. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that they're so out of sync, even though they're an offshoot of humanity. I mean, they're basically humans that have been left alone and kind of tainted by chaos. You yeah, well, they also had like five thousand years time. True. Lots of things happened five thousand years. It only took us ten thousand to uh, get to where we are nowadays. Oh yeah, but I mean, uh, especially you think about how quickly technology has developed in just like our last hundred years. Oh, also, for neat fact: they call the imperial forces aliens. <laughs> That was kind of a cool little bit. They're, you know, evil aliens that come from the stars. Uh, Meanwhile, they're praying to chaos. I love... On the visor. Absolutely love, too. That, um... Oh, gosh, where is it? Uh, Grammaticus carries a little psychic warning device called a meme seed. <laughs> yeah, true. Because modern problems require modern solutions. I do, and just meme seed helps him figure out more information. I love it that it's a seed from a psychic fruit that like grows warm and like yells if it senses psychic activity. That's terrific. I should not think too much about it, but shouldn't he also, you know, shouldn't it also get hot if he tells people that he can pass? Maybe it's just if you use bigger forces. John, he keeps stumbling a little bit around, gets lost even more, has to throw up because he gets really sick from something, and some people are coming and picking him up. Right. It feels like almost like the Nerthian Mafia are like gonna track him down and like break his thumbs or something. Yeah. No, no, it's it's better. It's the Imperial Mafia. <laughs> and it's a great introduction. I have a suspicion. You've been looking for me, John Grammaticus. Which has to be pretty horrifying if you are as a a double, no, he's a triple agent. Mm -hmm. Being in the city of somebody he's, pretend, or he's trying to get intelligence about, and they don't even know the personality he, they are supposed to know. They know his real name. However, that what happened. It is kind of cool, especially over like chapter four, you see kind of some of the back and forth. And it's neat that it's like the cabal is definitely not consistently in the superior position. It's like they have a few things over the Alpha Legion, but the Alpha Legion have also figured out a few things about them, like John Grammaticus, their operative. And they're not happy. Not happy at all. Well, like, um, let's see, who's the psyker, Cher, that the uh, Alpha Legion use? which I think it's super funny uh, when John Grammaticus uses uh, his psychic powers to influence the Alpha Legionnaire. Like, step back and keep your hands away from your weapons. Uh, the Alpha Legionnaires get irritated, and it's like, stop him doing that. <laughs> because he actually can, like, force, you know, a single space marine through, like, psychic compulsion to... But, of course, you know, the Alpha Legion has thought this through, and they have their own, like, psyker on retainer who is apparently pretty, uh, which is pretty impressive considering Grammaticus has like a thousand years of experience. Um, I don't think psychers grow with experience. They just are either strong or weak. Yes, I agree. But he's had a long time to really refine that talent and really get an idea of what he can and can't do. He gives, well, one of the things that... You also got to keep in mind, Cher, he is painful for John. And when you're in a lot of pain, I don't think you can really think about what you're doing. You just kind of try stuff to make it stop. That's a good point. If Cher was all that awesome, then how come he never detected that John was being influenced by another psyker that close by? Why did John not figure it out? I think John did. I think he just didn't know what where it was coming from or because I, I, you know when you're in pain it's really hard to concentrate so I, I think he knew he was being 
tracked. I think he knew something was influencing him. He just couldn't figure out where it was coming from and what to do about it. Or that it was coming from two individual sources. Right. Yeah. Because one of the things um, they, well, the Alpha Legion said, the Alpha Legion sex John, they had to get to him parley. They will not try to kill him. And he will not try to kill them either. They just want to talk because John is only there as a messenger. Like, he's a really bad uh, messenger bird. Because the message, the message is not even, hey, I would like to talk to you about this, that, and theirs. Nope, it's just, hey, I want to talk to you. He's the request on Facebook you normally ignore. <laughs> True. He's doing his best. He's trying. He's trying to explain um, what a cabal is. Meanwhile, Cher keeps torturing him. I don't, I don't like to share too much, I gotta say that. He's a little creepy. Oh, I feel like it's a requirement if you work with the Alpha Legion. And a Cabal, to be fair. Yeah. So, John tries to tell the Alpha Legion why he's there. Well, he doesn't even know himself why he's there, or what they want to talk about. Just that there are really important information. That it is for the Alpha Legion, and just for them, because they are the only Legion the Cabal tr and would entrust with the future. The only ones who would talk to them, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he also tells them that there's going to co come a great war but against themselves. Which, again, this is one of the multiple points in the storyline where somebody warned everybody that, hey, there's a giant war coming and we're going to fight against the Sturdies. But nobody seems to take this messenger serious. It's a pretty consistent theme, like across a dozen books, that somebody, be it Garo or yeah. a Remembrancer or John Grammatic. Or this weird space wolf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had signs coming, but they all ignored them. Which also tells us a lot about humanity, I guess. I would just say it's pretty similar. Yeah, well, I mean, Astartes and even the Primarchs are just humanity magnified. Oh, yeah. The best and worst of all. Mm -hmm. Though it does seem mostly worse. Thank goodness. I mean, they think they're the best. We know they're pretty much not. To your point of the Cabal, you know, being too late, maybe they really weren't because they wanted the war to come because that would help to start wiping out some of the numbers. I, I that they could have predicted some of the craziness that happened, you know, with within the heresy, but it did take down the numbers of humans around the galaxy. So the Cabal, to one end of their goal, started getting what they wanted. It's the whole thing. Nobody really, like, it's so hard to figure out what Cabal really wants. And potentially they had a different plan in place um, before this was the last resort. I don't know. Sam, you don't know what the Alpha Legion does, I guess. Besides have multiple personality disorder. Oh, that, that's real hard, yeah. Just put a psychologist in there, or a psych... Psychiatrist? Yeah, psychiatrist. Put the, put this guy in there, he has a field day. So for some reason, the Alpha... Or, well, whatever John told them was convincing enough for them that they will actually listen to him. And of course, him... Being a psyker, Shen being a psyker to just get a little bit buddy buddy, start talking, start a bit about how impressed they are with each other. And John is like, uh, oh yeah, Shen is a pyrokine, which I don't even know what it is, uh, just that it's I rare and powerful. Yeah, uh, pyrokine is a fire psyker. Pyro fire? Yes. Ooh, I don't want that in my mind. Probably why it hurt so much. Yeah, yeah. I'm testing out each other a little bit. And eventually they figure out that, um, hey, I was influenced since I got to go started being in the city. So we learned that Nithrina is really good at intelligence. So now let's think about it. How many parties do we have? We have the Alpha Legion. We have the Imperium. We have the Cabal. Then we have the Nithrans. And we have four different parties spying on each other. This is super, super weird. 
Everybody trying to manipulate manipulate everyone. Oh, yeah, it's very convoluted. I'm just wondering how they got all the lizards. Like, I, I mean, a psyker was involved, but how do you even get that many lizards into one place? Like, I just can't imagine. Do you like mentally just put them in some sort of net? Do you influence them to run in that direction? How do you do that? Are you like pied piping them like in the background? How do you? How do you do that? That's what I want explained at this point. How they got all the lizards to overwhelm the house like that. Yeah, because what happens is they really literally get overrun by lizards. Behind them, swarming lizards fill the hallways, making no sound except a plick plack of their billion sticky feet. So they are on the second floor of a building, and apparently the whole first floor just filled up with lizards. Just, ah! Just sticky little gecko feet. And then there's the, you know, the crocodilian. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, on the second floor, again, how did they get that there without them hearing it? I mean, do we know if it's is a crocodilian or if it just looks like one? Probably not. It could also be a demon looking like a crocodilian because that's the form they are praying to. Space magic. Space magic. Space magic. Air magic and space magic, very important components of the story. I also learned that the Alpha Legionnaires have real names. Oh, yeah. Herzog and, um, Arcus? Inigo Peck. Yeah, Peck, Herzog, and Arcus. Maybe that's why they die. Yeah, as soon as you get a name in this universe, your chances are you die faster. Or if you don't have a name, the chances are you also die. Well, you aren't how far you don't need to live. So there's a whole big fight scene about how this giant crocodile chews off the leg of uh, Herzog, the space marine. How they are fighting, trying to kill it, and John pulls out a super special weapon, which just kills the crocodile. And the only thing the Astartes says at that point, not thank you, not cool, I appreciate that you saved me. No, it's just, oh, where did you get the weapon? Why didn't you use it against me? It's very Alpha Legion, right? It's like, oh, I was not aware you had that secret hidden asset. Mm Mm-hmm. Tell me of its origin. Where can I buy one of those? (laughs) Do I need to order it on Amazon? Yeah, I'm going to look up Death Ring on Amazon right now. (laughs) You know, oh, now I'm scared for you. (laughs) So, they are cornered, they are lost in the house. Grammaticus used a super... Awesome weapon. They are surrounded. And there is a dragon showing up. All right. Here be dragons. Like, straight out of the middle of the street. Just a dragon. But at least that one appeared. I mean, it did crawl up from the the ground. So, again, it didn't just appear in the middle of the street. I mean, for all we know, everything could have just crawled through the windows and they just couldn't hear it because it was... Shield it somehow. But it said the only thing that you heard from the lizards was the gecko feet plopping on the floor. Well, once they're inside, and once there's a wave of them. I wonder if they just waited till they had enough geckos to make a wave and then let the sound come back. Right? Doesn't that just mentally give you an image of what's going on outside of the house and somebody just continuing to shove geckos in the door? <laughs> I just like to I, I think about those frozen geckos. Like those little lizards looking like toys. So maybe they just put a few decoy fake toys in there. So it looks like a wave of geckos and a few living ones to give it some life. Right. It just like CGI in a few. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, psychers are CGI in real life. Yeah. In Warhammer, at least. And once the dragon appears... There's not much more they can do. They try, still try to fight a li- it a little bit. Meanwhile, Grammaticus just runs. He just bails. He's heading back for his lady friend, because it's been 700 years, so he's got to, you know... Yeah, he, he has important plans. And he doesn't even check back on the people he was, he wa- he tried to arrange a rendezvous with for his cabal. It's, it just bails on them and runs away. It, it, it's fine. I'm sure they're fine. Like, oh, they will be fine. Everything's fine. Right? 
He's got to get back to his lady friend, okay? I don't know what the problem so, is. I love that the cabal, like, checks in just to nag him and say, like, hey, hey, quit hooking up with chicks with baggage. But they don't, like, not a word from Gehet that he's just, like, bailed on his contact with the Alpha Legion. I mean, to be, there needs to be a reflective surface, and I guess the dragon just uh, liberated all of them. I'm sure there's no more water puddles. Also, I don't think he minded him hooking up. He he was he minded the feelings. I'm just saying, Gehet's got weird priorities. Yeah, that's fair. Also, while you're running away, I don't think they could um like get in touch with you that easy. Maybe I don't know. John, John, John. I just imagine him jumping from one surface to the next just constantly as John's running, like, John, 20 feet down the road, like... Like, window, puddle, toaster, <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, or like a matrix, just reflections everywhere. <laughs> Looking at him, John! We gotta talk! What are you doing? Hey, <laughs> listen! <laughs> and you would go there. Somehow I knew it. You know, at least Navi was. I don't know. She was, seemed. She seemed to, to be help, to have been helpful. I don't know how helpful this guy was to John, apart from nagging. I mean, Gehet is kind of like. Um, I don't know. He's kind of like the taskmaster for the cabal, like yeah. the head nagger. Is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's got a schedule to keep. That's fair. He has plans, and then John just. But, hey, everything also could just be how they planned it to make it more interesting. Because who doesn't like a messenger who runs away and has your uh, your talent for intelligence even more because you lost them? Or they just in the end say, yeah, that's totally what we wanted you to do, John. Just, we expected you to bail. We expected this. We expected a dragon. We expected you to bail. It's fine. This can't be the first time that something has gone wrong while he's been doing undercover work, if he's been doing this for a thousand years. I mean... I mean he seemed pretty shocked. I would assume this was the first time. At least the first time for, like, a giant space lizard from the center of a roadway. Oh, not even the space lizard. I'm talking about them figuring out John Grammaticus and not just Koenig. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, he did seem pretty shooken up about that. It would be if I'm just walking into a Walmart and somebody walks out and says, Carolyn! <laughs> I would not expect that. <laughs> when I got your RSVP to our wedding, I was like, who's Carolyn? <laughs> so he the, you know, knowing you as Caro. So yeah, I would I would imagine that would uh, shake you up. Oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a, on the cover here as well. Yeah. <laughs> Very inconspicuous. Yeah, and the best cover is if you tell everybody you're on the cover, right? Totally. I mean, it worked yeah. for John Grammaticus, basically. Pretty much. And this is also where we leave this part of the book for now. While John Grammaticus just keeps running. Or how we say it, um, er gibt Gold. Maybe it's for contact. He has to run a certain amount. Yeah, maybe. Or it's one of those benefits marathons. <laughs> This episode of Heresy Book Club, part of the Remembrancers Retreat, is made possible with the generous support of our patrons. Starting with our Legion Predators, Alex Self, Taco Tuesday at Bus 22 Rock and Roll McDonald's, Chris Mack, Gardner.Tree of Woe, Joe from Music City Heresy, Luke Rizzuto, Matthew Boyce, Mr. Baldwick, Nicholas Quenga, and Sar Luther. Our Legion Centurions, Aaron Maynard, Andrew N., Angry Boy, Dave Jones, Duncan, Ed, Jerry Austin, John Christensen, M. Tanzer, Gore Crow, Queen Corswain, Scott LeMay, and the original Applesauce. And finally, our Legion Sergeants, Agrippina, Emily O'Hare, Garrett Lowe, Mr. Sear, Nick Gillen, the entirety of Legio Audax, Lizoy, and What Do I Call Myself. Thank you all so much for your support, and if you enjoy our program and would like to support us as well, go over to patreon.com forward slash rr30k podcast you can also find us on facebook at rr30k podcast on instagram at rr30k you can also visit us on our website at rr30k.com there you can find the battlefield heresy compendium a 
154-page homebrew document for playing Battlefleet Gothic set in the Age of Darkness. You can also find a growing collection of articles and tutorials there as well. Once again, thanks for listening. Be sure to follow us. And until next time, keep those dice rolling.